I've always said if you don't have a historical understanding of our nation and how it got to where it's at, then you're really not good because you're going to make decisions based on a gut feeling instead mm. of an intellectual feeling. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to Framework Leadership, a podcast about principles and ideas you can use today to take your leadership to the next level. I'm your host, Ken Engel, president of Southeastern University. And I'm your co-host, Michael Steiner, vice president for innovation. And we're excited again to welcome back Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg to our podcast. General Kellogg serves as co-chair of the Center for American Security at the America First Policy Institute. Highly decorated, re retired three-star Army general who earned the Distinguished Service Medal, the Silver Star, several Bronze Stars, most recently served as the National Security Advisor to former President Donald Trump. General Kellogg also served as the Chief of Staff and Executive Secretary of the National Security Council. Great accomplishments to recognize and an honor to have you again on the show. Sure. Thanks for being here. Thanks. For, I'm glad to be here with you. Can't uh, get that out. <laughs> it's great to have you here. I, I want to start our conversation off by discussing your uh, incredible career in, in government and the military. Tell us, you had the opportunity to work with, with many leaders in the White House and other sectors. What principles did you learn from them and how did it impact your leadership? Yeah, I think a lot of it, as I talked I talked about transferable skills, is kind of the, the skills that I brought not only from my family, which I was very, very fortunate to grow up in a family that had a very strong value set. And and, uh, and I saw that in the military and continued that into the, the, into the government. And I thought a lot of that is, I said, okay, what do I really see in a leader that I admired or mm -hmm. tried to uh, continue to advance when I was in the government? And a lot of it is based off personal integrity and making sure that that you can walk at the end of a day, walk out of the, wherever you're at and say, I did it right, I tried to do it right, I tried to do it right for nation, tried to do it right for myself, tried to do it right for my family, tried to do it right for God, was I right or wrong and, and did it. And I think this personal integrity, it, if people see that in you mm, in sure. government, they kind of realize you're kind of not untouchable, but you're close to being untouchable, meaning he's not going to deviate at all from the value set that he had all through his life. So mine are not, you know, values that I just created in the last five years or 10 years, mm -hmm. but it's something I actually grew up with with my family. And I, and I think I carried that into government as well. I love it. And, you know, I was going through some of, some of the stories you're talking about in your book, and, and so much of your formation was during the, the Vietnam War and right. different things like that. Can you tell us about some of the principles you observed during that conflict, the leaders that you got to serve with, and how that informs your leadership today? Yeah, well, part of it is it's... Uh, it, it, there's, there's always an element in the military, especially in combat, of personal risk, and you know, in the fact that you're willing to. I hate to say it, it sounds kind of, you know, trite, but you know, sacrifice for your fellow man, the willing of selflessness and in, in, in getting mm -hmm. out there and going through that fight. And you saw that, and you don't, you just reacted to what was happening. And so the personal value set that you had, your willingness to love of nation, patriotism. Mm -hmm. Uh, love of your fellow man, and and that was there. And then it's you know, we didn't talk about it. It's not something right. you sat down over a cup of coffee and you said, "Well, this is the reason I want to do this." It was, it, you know, you saw that it was kind of ingrained in people. You kind mm -hmm. of uh, you kind of knew it, and it's kind of interesting because what I saw in the military and also in government, you kind of it's almost instinctive. You kind of know when somebody has that. Yeah. And it's not only the way they talk, but it's the way they act and the kind of the way they are. And I would always somehow be attracted to people that had that value set that mm -hmm. I kind of knew I trusted them. I knew yeah. that in the very toughest of fights, they would be with me. And in combat, in, like in Vietnam, you had to have an understanding of that value set. You had to know that who was going to be with you in the tough fight, who you could rely on. But you, but you, there wasn't time in a fight that you'd reach over and go, hey, uh, you're going to be with me on this thing. You just right. had to know it was right. there. And the same thing when I, I was able to transfer that into into. In, into the government as well, because you kind of knew who was on your team and the value set that they brought with them. And by the way, it's not it's not something that's universal, mm -hmm. and it's not something it's it's sometimes you don't see people live up to the value sets that you want. So I was able to carry that for, forward from Vietnam. Love it, love, and I love this idea that that your values are not just about your statement and your standards, but it's a way for you to know who to trust with each other. That's so powerful for, for students. As as we've get you know, we've got a lot of listeners on the show, they're in their first careers, they're really kind of stepping out of their world, really trying to understand what their values are for the first time in the political sphere. How can they take the time to distill that for themselves and how do they know like, hey, this is a value I can rest on versus something yeah. that was tough. You know, that that's a that's a great question because that that's actually something that I have found you actually, to me, really reflected back on of how did I get to where I was at. And I'd, I'd probably say to somebody right now if they were growing up, here's what I'd like you to do. Um, 
Now, I, you know, Grant, mm-hmm. I'm a you know, graduate of Santa Clara University Catholic School, and I'd say, and if you're religious, go do this. But I'd say, it, here's what I would like you to do, just for me. Just take a day to do it, or maybe two days, is go to, to your church where there's no services. Go sit in the church, or go sit in your backyard, or go sit overlooking the ocean, or go sit overlooking mountains, and really reflect on what you want to be. Mm. No holds barred. You to be honest with yourself, and you make that determination. This is what I want to be, and here's how I want. Here's how I'm going to get there, and here are all the troubles along the way. I'm going to find that, and really kind of start, not finish it, but start to establish who you are as a person. Mm. And and I think it's important that young people actually do that. It's what I've told, you know, my kids. I say, look, I'm telling you something because I'm older mm-hmm. and I've done this before. But I think it's a value that you set you set, and determine who you are and understand yourself. Yeah. It's not going to be perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You may have it wrong. You're going to have to adjust as you go along. That's kind of because the world is an adjusting place. But start with a set of values that there's, you're saying to yourself, I'm going to hold these to be the truths of my life. Yeah. And I yeah. plan on staying with it. And I know that you're going to be... There's going to be bad angels on my left shoulder and good angels on my right shoulder. And no one to knock the bad angels off. And no one you're going to have things come at you. And no one you're going to have, when you're going to have to make these judgments. And start reflecting on that. Because if you don't have a value set, then there's no place to run to. Right. There's no place to go hide. And, and the reason I say go this is by yourself is that this is between you and you, mm-hmm. but nobody mm-hmm. else. And make those decisions that this is who I want to be in life, not only for yourself, for your family, or your children later on. Mm. Yeah, I love so it. good. I want to uh, talk about your educational background. You earned uh, a bachelor's degree in political science from Santa Clara University and your master's in international affairs from the University of Kansas. Before studying uh, senior level management dip- di- diplomacy at the Army War College, but tell us about the importance of your education and how that has impacted your life uh, and and role and contributed to your your roles as a leader in, in you know current administrations. Yeah, it's it's you know, a lot of it is you know, when you think back and said okay well you know he took history he took political science and we studied all the classics but here this will probably throw you I said believe it or not one of the classes that I really reflect back on is theology mm, yes. and and I thought back on it and and it was. Uh, and I had a, uh, you know, a professor who was, in, he was a Jesuit priest, Austin Fagathy, and I, and, I, and I can name probably three professors in college, and he's mm-hmm. one of them that I remembered out there. And, and it, it was the value set, and he was the one who kind of said, okay, establish your value sets, and this is what you think. And, and I was one of the intransigents in, in college, you know, because I, I kept saying, okay, you've got to kind of prove to me there's a God. And he kept kind of going back to faith. And because I'm one of those who says, everything's got a container. Like, where does the universe end? It's mm-hmm. sort of like a class. Where does yeah. this thing end? And, and, and we talked about values. And I said, that is what kind of propelled me when I went into politics and the political side of it is that's kind of my anchor. It's not the fact that I know when the Magna Carta was written, right. you know, or who won the war of 1812. It's none of that. Uh, but that, and then I look at, and then I studied very hard because I believed in it on the decision decision making and the president's decision making and the powers of the president and what he can do for America. But it's you set up with a value set and said, okay, th- th- this is what's right. And, uh, and it's so Santa Clara was good, but it was something I never th- would have thought of later on. And um, where did you learn it, and why? Because people said, "Well, did, did you learn statistics, or did you learn you know, pol- mm-hmm. political science?" Was well, now, believe it or not, the anchor was theology, and it just was because it forced me to think internally and think right. externally right. as well. Right. That's love so it, good. Love it. And so we, you know, we have a lot of students majoring in political science as you as well, um, as, as you did, as they're thinking about what to do with their career and reflecting mm-hmm. all this different experience. What advice would you give them? Either if they want to do politics or they want to step out, what's the best way to kind of navigate that experience? For yeah, the, the first thing I think is, is I would tell everybody, be as smart as you can in politics. And then what I mean by that is really understand the political environment, not the current environment, but the historical cycle that you see in, politi- in mm. politics. And, and I would say be a student 
of history. And yeah. what I mean, let's use American history as an example. You know, I tell anybody involved that wants to be in American politics, if you haven't read the Federalist Papers, read the Federalist yeah, Papers. Yeah. Right. That's a good you know, and, and go back and, and see the presidents and see how they were formed and see what it was like in our nation. And you have to have a, a feeling for the nation. And then break, break. Then you mm-hmm. kind of look at what is the basics, the philosophical basis of the United States of America. And then what I mm-hmm. found is the smarter you are, the better you are when you're com- competing, you might want to mm-hmm. say. Are you going into the environment? And then would say, well, where would I go to? I said, well, first of all, you know, nobody starts off by going right into the White House. Is it, well, for the right, most part. Right. There are some where they're junior. Mm-hmm. Uh, t- t- they're going with us. But it's sort of like, okay, start at the local level, the state level, and you, then you get in the federal level. But look for the opportunities to work. Uh, with with people, even up in Congress, mm-hmm. try to find the internships, like the White House in, has internships, and get involved in the political process. Mm-hmm. And don't be jaded by it. I mean, yeah. because a lot of people become very, very jaded by it. I said, no, it's just the way it is. But I, I've always said, if you don't have a historical understanding of our nation and how it got to where it's at, then you're really not good because you're going to make decisions based on a gut feeling instead mm-hmm. of an intellectual feeling. And I used to, one of the things I used to pride myself on, even when I was in the White House, was the fact that, okay, I kind of knew a historical basis of how we got to where we're at. And you wouldn't lord people over, but you kind of say, I kind of know where we're coming from. And I, you know, I used to, for example, I used to pres- tell President Trump, sir, believe it or not, there are no new good ideas, okay? They're all, they went out there before. <laughs> and it's just been framed a different way out there. And it's, it's and, I, and I said, and there's been presidents that have been like you before in the past and not like you in the past. Mm. So it's all based on, I, I think it, it's a challenge, but I think anybody that goes into politics or political environment or working in political science, uh, it's a real, real great field to be in. It's a lot of fun to be in, but boy, you better have a strong uh, strong constitution for it because some days are good and some days are really, really right. bad. Yeah. What would be advice to those who want to go into military service or continue their military yeah. career? I, well, if, first, I'm a product of the military. My daughter was a West, a West Point graduate and she served, served, fought in Afghanistan. My youngest son graduated of West Point. And uh, fought in Afghanistan as well. Her son, my son-in-law, my daughter's husband, fought the six tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. So they've all been involved in the fight out there. And my concern today with with the military is where it's reached a point. And I think I've got some real criticisms of the military. I've been very, very vocal about it. Is that I said, you know, in the military, when the defense it was in the defense side of the house. The military's role is very simple. It's to deter, and if deterrence fails, fight and win our nation's wars. Well, I think in today's military, and this is a disturbing piece, it is not a primary role, it's not a secondary role, it is a tertiary role. And they forgot what their their role in life is. Their job is to make sure that they're in the ramparts of freedom, and there are barbarians at the gate, is to fight those barbarians back. And I th- think we've forgotten that. So those in the military, I said, it's a fault of the senior leadership, mm. uh, and that needs to be adjusted a bit. But I, and I say this strongly because I love the military and my you know I'm, my wife was in the military my daughter's been in the military my son's in the military son-in-law I've fought in the military I loved it but I'm very concerned about where it is today and the corrections that need to be uh, need to be made in there it's a it, it's a harsh assessment to make but I think it needs to be said because of the primary role they need to remember what their role in his life they need to be apolitical Mm. And they also need to be able to fight our nation's wars because there's not a lot of them. When right. you think about the size of the military, it's not that big. And we count on them to do what there's, that needs to be done to protect our nation. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's, it's not just it, not just the role that they serve for our whole society, but the, what they do for so many individuals, right? The, the military is many places people's first careers. It's their first clients. Mm-hmm. And so if, if senior leadership is in, in alignment there, if we have a values problem, in one of the main bastion industries, right? How can we expect the other industries to not not have issues? What are some of the other challenges you see facing America today as you're looking out? You know, this yeah. military thing is with, where do we go from there? I think uh, several. I think one, in, it's actually showed in polling, I think there's a decrease in the value of patriotism. And I think mm. that's unfortunate. You know, this is a great nation. I mean, people fight to come here. They don't fight to leave it. And I think people need to understand the value of patriotism. And what, you know, it doesn't mean we don't have warts. Of course we do. All nations do. But the value of this nation, mm. the value of the, of, of the fact that we're a republic, and what it means to be a republic, mm-hmm. I think uh, I think there's, and it's, it, I hate to say this, I think there's been a movement that's moving a bit of a way from God, which I think is a huge mistake as well. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and the value sets and the value propositions. And part of that is, 
the, the family structure, I think, has been challenged quite strongly. Mm. I think uh, the education structure has been challenged quite strongly. And I think, and I tell people, you need to fight back. You need to push back. You know, we, we're on the side of goodness. We're mm-hmm. right, okay? Yeah. Don't be afraid to say that. Don't be afraid when people push. You push real hard back. And you're yep. going to be challenged by that. And sometimes this, in the society we're in, we just say, well, if we're just nice to everybody, it's going to go away. It's not. Mm. I think we're under constant threat, constant pressure. You know, a good example of this recently happened in New York City where that uh, former Marine yes. uh, with, with a homeless mm-hmm. individual put him in a chokehold. The individual died. The, you know, everybody is taking on the Marine. They forget that this individual, even uh, the tragedy of him being homeless, but every, the, what he had done and previously, to include threats he'd given against society out there, it's not the Marines you should be concerned about. You should be concerned about how did we allow this environment to occur with our homeless population, the mental illness right. that we find in our population, and how did we get here? And we're, we're talking about the wrong people. So what this has really taught the people on challenging taking him to uh, being charged of, uh, with, uh, what is it right now, second-degree manslaughter. manslaughter. When you look at it, you go, so what you're really telling me is don't get involved. Right. Don't don't protect people on the subway. Don't right. will be willing to do it. What that telling the mom? She's telling her kids, if you get on the subway and see some problems, go the other way. Well, I want people who move towards the sound right. of gunfire. I want people who are willing to do that. And those are the sets that I think in society we're starting to see that we need to push back on. Mm-hmm. We need to stand up and say, I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud mm-hmm. of the value sets. Yes, we've had issues, but we've overcome those issues out there. Yes, you want to be informed. But, oh, by the way, there's population sets that we need to take care of. We haven't. Why haven't we spent the money on, you know, we're spending $150 billion in Ukraine. Why have we spent some money on mental illness? Right. Why have we tried to figure out what's causing these issues out there? Why haven't we taken on, why is why is that the, the, the issue of homelessness so so large. You go to Austin, Texas, it's massive. You go to Washington, D.C., it's massive. How do we get to this situation? Mm-hmm. How do we fix it? Yeah, so good. Well, and when you think of what's going on in our in our uh, society right now, what, what encouragement would you give those who are very discouraged about uh, the state of America right now? Yeah, I'd say hang in there. <laughs> I'd, say, mm-hmm. I'd say just, I, I would tell people, be engaged. Don't accept the status quo. You need to stand up. You need to say something. You need to talk about it. You understand, accept the fact that you're going to be criticized, but don't worry about it because you're really on the right side. But there needs to be more and more more Americans standing up and saying, that's enough. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to do this. But it's the role of the concerned citizen, the, the patriot citizen that you see out there. Uh, that that needs to be very, very vocal. And I think because of that, Americans have kind of, you know, a lot of marriages just don't want to be confrontational, which I understand that. But it's reaching a point you've kind of have to set the mark and that you refuse to be compromised. I'm not going to, my values are not going to be compromised. I, I, my wife knows it with me. She said, you know, she says, you know, she'll kind of drag me back. She said, no, I'm not. And she says, sometimes with some friends of ours, I've been abrupt. And I said, well, I'm not going to play a fool anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to take the fact that if I think they're wrong, I'm going to tell them they're wrong and I'm going to tell them why I think they're wrong. They can have their opinion, which is fine, but I'm not going to sit back and just let their opinion flow and not respond to it if I think it's incorrect. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more Americans need to stand up and say, I'm not going to take this anymore. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be involved in local politics. I'm going to be involved in government. I'm going to be involved in the school boards, and that's a big one with school boards. I'm going to be involved with my children. When you send a kid to school, they are not the teacher's kids. They're still my kids. Right, right. And the value sets that they learn there, I want to know what they're being taught in there. Mm-hmm. If I have to put a, you know, and I have Northern Virginia, I said, you know, put a proctor in there. Put a, a family proctor in there. Listen to what the kids are being taught. And then and challenge on that. And I and that hasn't done. They found that out in Northern Virginia. They pushed back on it really, really hard. And I, mm-hmm. I think they, that's why I believe one of the reasons why Governor Youngkin won the governorship there is he pushed back so hard on it. I love it. I love so it. Hey, last question before we kind of close out. You know, where what are some of the other issues you think is going to be very important for Americans to keep their eye on in the years to come? What are some of the big things that we need to be, as you said, engaged? with thinking about, talking about, and working on with our with yeah, our society. I, I think it's, it's a worldview. And mm-hmm. what I mean by a worldview is where do we sit, where do we should be in, in America. And that's where I, you know, again, I was with 
you know, Trump for a long time, and when he, as I said, went to the UN General Assembly and spoke about national sovereignty, and his, his, his view was you have to understand your nation and, and to understand the, ro- the role of sovereignty mm-hmm. in a nation. And, you know, where I'm at right now with this organization, the American First Policy Institute, you know, we say, look, it's pretty simple in the Constitution. The th- first three words, the reason they're so large and Golden words, emblazoned words of we the people. It's all about the people of America. Mm-hmm. And I think as long as you, that's your anchor, that's your North Star, then I think we're going to be okay. Yeah. And we have to keep saying that. It's all about the people of America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so good. Well, we're going to move in our fire round. You're, you're no stranger to our fire round. You've been yeah. on, this, on the show before. Uh, just ask a few quick questions. Um, get some practical advice. We'll, we'll just ask three quick questions. Michael, why don't you start? Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So uh, question number one, what do you think is the most important quality for a leader to have? Most important quality is personal integrity. Mm -hmm. That's good. And it's uh, followed very closely by personal courage. I love it. It's huge. Second question, how can someone in high-level government positions successfully balance their personal life and public life? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of like a my dad told me years ago, he said, make sure when people talk to you, you, only, you tell the truth. I said, okay, just for the heck of it, why? He said, because you only have to remember one story. That's right. And I said, said, I got that. And it's, it's, if, you, if that creates your balance, make sure that you have the same balance in private as you do in public, and then you're going to be okay. That's good. I love it, love it. Last question, how can leaders, um, as you said, you know, courage, personal courage is such a matter. How do you lead with courage in this society? What's the first step that somebody should take? I think the, the first step is being willing to, when everybody else is sitting and when hard things happen, be willing to stand up. Mm-hmm. Be, with, if, be the first one up. Because when the first one's up, then the second and the third and the right. fourth will go. But be willing to be the first one up and say, this is wrong or this is what I need to do. Love it. Yeah. Huge. Well, General Kellogg, thank you for being on the show today. And thank you, more importantly, for your distinguished service to our nation and how you continue to be a great voice of uh, insight and wisdom and knowledge to uh, encourage all of us in understanding we, the people, and it's all about our nation and country. So thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you want to stay up to date with General Kellogg, you can follow him on Twitter, at General Kellogg. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on podcast, uh, our Framework Leadership Podcast today. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us today on Framework Leadership. If you're watching on YouTube right now, now would be a great time to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can get more leadership content right into your YouTube feed. You can also check us out on Instagram at Kent underscore Engel at Dr. Michael Steiner or on Twitter and YouTube at Kent Engel. And hey, if you love great email newsletters, and I know that I do, you want to check out the Framework Leadership Newsletter. Every single Friday drops in great tips to be a better leader, resources, thoughts right into your inbox. Check it out. You can sign up at kentingle.com. Make sure you hop onto there. Thank you so much for listening to Framework Leadership. Take care, everybody.